Thank you, Janice, for that special music. <clears throat> I suspect um, without looking at the Hebrew Bible, when it says in Psalm 101, I will walk in my home yeah. with a perfect heart. The yeah. word for perfect is tamim, which means healthy. Oh. Well, we all want a healthy heart yeah. physically, and we want a healthy heart morally. And so I think what the psalmist probably meant was I will walk, I will live in my home with a healthy relationship with the Lord. So okay, that's what we all that's what we all want. Well, uh, years ago, I was the interim pastor of a church in a western suburb, and I asked the congregation, how many of you have ever heard a series of sermons on the book of Joel? One man held his hand up. And he said, I've never heard a series of sermons on Joel, but I've heard in my lifetime one sermon on Joel. So I want to ask the same question here. How many of you have ever heard a series of sermons on the book of Joel? Let me see your hand. Everyone in the Bible study studied Joel just last year. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Wow. Yeah, on the Thursday night uh, Bible study, Bible study yes. Joel, Joel was uh, studied. But now I'm asking, how many of you have heard a series of sermons on the book of Joel? Let me see your hand. Okay, next question. How many of you have ever heard from a pulpit in a Sunday worship service a sermon on Joel? Okay, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, uh, so it must be then that Joel does not belong in the Bible. <laughs> it is divinely inspired. Uh, God is of the opinion Joel is important. He thinks you and I would benefit from hearing this portion of his word. And so this morning I want to begin a series of four sermons on Joel. Today, uh, the first sermon will be to introduce that book to us, lay the foundation, give us a good idea of what this book's about and prepare us for the next three Sunday mornings for uh, taking uh, a chapter for each uh, Sunday for each of the three sermons coming up. Now the prophet is going to uh, open his book in chapter 1 and verse 8 by saying well like a virgin dressed in sackcloth over her fiance. And why wail like a virgin over her fiancé? Well, her fiancé must have died. Now, uh, years ago, I had a student at Moody named Rita Kotzier, born and raised in Nazareth, who was a student at Moody. And now, uh, she was engaged, and about a month before she married, her fiancé just dropped dead. And then she married somebody else, and... Uh, had a child, and their Erika's daughter came here about a month or two ago to our Wednesday uh, noon prayer meeting. Um, and I can't remember her name. So what was that girl's name? You remember Erika's daughter's name? Uh, old fine young lady. She came here and really enjoyed our prayer meeting. But I do, I do want to say something about uh, Leah. Now, I don't, I don't know that I've ever mentioned Leah to you. I don't remember her first name, don't remember her last name. I call this particular girl at Moody Leah by her middle name. I do remember she's from the uh, state of Iowa. And in her sophomore year, she came to my office and said, Dr. Sauer, what I'm thinking about doing is quitting Moody when this year's over with, drop out, go home, and get married. And I said, Leah, and she said, what do you think about that? And I said, Leah, I just don't really think that you're ready for marriage. My suggestion is, don't drop out of booty. Take your junior and senior year and then think about getting married. Mm -hmm. Well, um, and I said, now I'm not telling you that's what God wants you to do, but you're asking my advice. My advice is don't quit. Get your, de get your degree, then get married. And uh, as the year progressed, another two or three times she would come to my office to see if I had changed my mind. No, <laughs> I changed my mind. I still think you ought to uh, wait until you graduate and get married. Well, at the end of that school year, she came to my office and said, I have made my decision, and I don't mean to show you any disrespect, but I'm going against your advice. And I said, Leah, that's okay. I told you that I cannot 
inform you what God's will for you is. You ask my opinion on it. I'm glad to give you my opinion. And so what have you decided to do? She said, well, I'm going to drop out and I'm going to uh, go home and get married. Now, before the school year was over with, she brought her fiancé to my office to uh, introduce him to me. I was so impressed with this young man. Uh, he was uh, on staff at Campus Crusade for Christ, just really dedicated to the Lord, worked at some uni uh, secular university in Florida, uh, giving the gospel out to those university students. And so I can understand why she wanted to marry him. I just don't see how you could find a better young man to marry than her fiancé. So when, when school was over, she finished her sophomore year, went to Iowa to prepare her wedding, and a week before the wedding, he dropped dead. And they don't know why. The autopsy could not uh, find a reason for his death. And so a week later, uh, after his death, with her hand on his coffin, she sang at his funeral the song that she had planned to sing at their <coughs> wedding. And so uh, Joel is saying, to all of Judea, we should wail like a woman who has just lost her fiancé to some untimely death. Now, the, Joel, uh, the prophet Joel is going to call on Judah to well. And note, I want you to note now some of the uh, words of mourning found in chapter 1. He's going to say in verse 5, wake up and wait. The priests mourn, verse 9. Be ashamed, O uh, farmers, verse 11. Lament, O priests, verse 13. Why all this mourning and grief? Because of Israel's sins against God. And what's so bad about the nation's sin? Their sins have brought about devastating effects in their country. Now notice what uh, some of these devastating effects are that it refers to in chapter 1. The fields are ruined. The harvest is lost. All trees are withered, verse 7. Joy is dried up from the people, verse 12. The food supply has failed, 16. The stores are empty, 17. Now, what does sin do to a nation? Destroys it. What does sin do to, look, an individual person? It ruins our life. It causes us to forfeit the blessings of God. Sin in a person's life is like decay in the tomb. It's like cancer in the body. Decay, cancer, destroys healthy tissue and wood degrades the body. And as long as you and I allow deliberate sin in our life, it's going to have an eroding, destructive effect on you and me. It will destroy the individual's life. It will destroy our national life, our country. So all of these horrible effects justifies Joel calling on Israel to mourn. Israel is far from God, and yet there's still time to do something about that. In like manner, James uh, 4 in the New Testament says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Now how do we draw near to God? Next line, cleanse your hands, you sinners. What does he mean by that? Stop committing sin. Next line, purify your hearts, you double-minded. Now, not only stop the sins of action, stop the sins of thought, the sins of heart. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned in the morning and your joy to gloom. Years ago, I had a couple at Moody Bible Institute, they were students, in my office counseling them about their sexual immorality. They were boyfriend and girlfriend, they were engaging in sex. And when I talked to them about it, they just laughed in my face. Their heart was so hard. To them, it was a funny matter. Now, Israel's laughing about their sin. America, it seems to be unashamed of its sin. Amen. And God is saying, you need to weep and mourn over your sins. Now, unless Israel's moral misconduct stops, and they morally begin to change for the better, things will only get worse. So uh, Israel is to, as 1.14 says, announce a holy fast. 
proclaim a solemn assembly of abstinence. Abstinence from what? Abstinence from work? Abstinence, abstinence from sinning. Cry out earnestly to the Lord for help. Notice that? Cry out to the Lord for help. Folks, every human being has self-destructive tendencies within him. The Christian life is God saving me from myself. And as I look around the sins in America, I've told Sue several times, the Lord is going to have to come back and save our country from ourselves. Man is incapable of running his own life rightly. He needs help to do that. God created a perfect garden, put a perfect man and a perfect woman in there, and what did they do? They begin to defile the garden. They begin to ruin the garden. And God said, because of you, cursed is the ground because of your sin. So man takes what is good, and we find a way to defile it and corrupt it. And how will the Lord respond to their repentance and their prayer? What he promises in 2.25, I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten. Have you seen them? We all have. Our sin will inflict terrible effects in our life and relationship. So the message of Joel is for you and me as well as for ancient Israel. We should be able to learn from their mistakes. Mm -hmm. So today we begin a short four-week series on the book of Joel. Today for introduction, next three studies, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. Now to help us prepare for this study, today we want to, we want to be introduced to, to this book of the Bible. And to assist us in doing that, a handout has been prepared for you. Does anybody need the handout? You don't have this handout now, you will be lost as we go through this. Uh, this is really a four-page handout that I've reduced to three pages. There's so much information here, I have put most of it down for you so you don't have to take the time and effort to write it down. So let's begin on chapter one, uh, page one of your handout. We're going to hit on a certain issue, Roman one, the author. Now, notice what I've written here. According to the very first verse, the author is Joel, and his authorship is confirmed in Acts 2, 16. Here the inspired apostle Peter said, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. So if you ask Peter who wrote that book named Joel, he would, he would obviously answer, well, of course, it was written by Joel himself. His father was Pethuel. He lived in or around Jerusalem, which provided the book setting. Nothing more is known of either the son or the father than what is in this book. Now, I take that uh, to really be nice, good. He was an humble man. He was not going to talk about himself. He was going to talk about God and his countrymen. That reminds me of John the Baptist. I must decrease. Jesus must increase. The more you and I can withdraw to the background, the more Jesus can come to the foreground and people focus on him rather than on us. And I think Joel had that kind of heart. Mm -hmm. Roman 2, recipients. The, the book is addressed to the inhabitants of Jerusalem mm -hmm. and Judah. Okay, so quick geography lesson. Uh, here is the, what do you tell me? What body of water is that? See a galley. What body of water is it? Dead Sea. Dead Sea. What body of water connects the two? The Jordan River. Jordan River. Okay, so about right here, oh, uh, not far from the north end of the Dead Sea is the city of Jerusalem. And now this area here, most of this area here is Judah or Judea, the southern half, the southern part of the country, and this is where Joel lives, and he's speaking to the people here in Judea. Now keep in mind, um, he's speaking to a generation before the Assyrians and the Babylonians invade. Let's go to Roman 3, date. This is important. Joel was written about 830 BC. This date is suggested by the following reason. One, no king is mentioned in the book. Governing responsibilities are handled by elders and priests, as happened in 830 B.C., when Joash, crowned at seven years of age, was guided by the high priest. Two, Israel's major foes, Assyria and Babylon, who conquered in 722 B.C., 
586, uh, 586 BC are not explicitly mentioned. But the nations earlier in minor foes are listed. Egypt, Edom, Tyre, Sidon, and Philistia. Three, the temple mentioned appears to be Solomon's and it is in existence when Joel wrote. So this book was obviously written prior to 586 BC when the temple was destroyed by the Babylonians who invaded their country. Now let's go to Roman 4 and set the prophecy of Joel in its historical context. One, the book begins with the first seven verses referring to the recent past. Judah and Jerusalem had just been devastated by a locust plague. Now he says in 1 4, what the cutting locust left, the swarming locust devoured. What the swarming locust left, the leaping locust devoured. What the leaping locust left, the destroying locust devoured. There are different types of locusts. And evidently, this locust uh, plague was so <coughs> intense, they left almost nothing for the people and the livestock to eat. So, I'm still in number one of Roman 4. So the prophet, so the prophet calls for a solemn fast to cry to God to avert, avert further and lasting consequences stemming from the plague. Uh, 114, announce a holy fast. Proclaim a solemn assembly of abstinence. Gather the leaders and all who live in the land to the house of the Lord your God, the temple, and cry out earnestly to the Lord for help. Rome, uh, number two, chapter two takes a glimpse into the near future. The day of the Lord, and I want you to remember that expression. We're going to come back to it. The day of the Lord is approaching and bringing divine judgment. 2-1, blow a trumpet in Zion, that's Jerusalem, and sound an alarm on my sacred mount. All the inhabitants of the land ought to tremble because the day of the Lord is approaching. In fact, it is near. What's so bad about the day of the Lord? Oh, we're about to find out. This judgment foreshadowed by recent local, uh, recent local plague consists in a hostile army invading Judah and overwhelming Jerusalem. 2-7. Like warriors, they will charge. Like commandos, they will scale the walls. And each will advance straight ahead. They will not break ranks. So even at this late hour, God invites the Judeans to repent and turn to him in order to avoid his judgment meted out by this coming invasion. Now, what is that locust plague a symbol of? The Assyrian army. The Babylonian army invading Judea. Those catastrophes lie in the nation's near future, and God is warning them. If you, my people, don't stop your sin, I am going to use the Assyrians and the Babylonians as a rod to chasten you by invasion. And they will destroy your country. They will take you in exile against your will back to their country. And all of that warning went in this ear and out the other. They refused to listen. They refused to stop their sinning. And true to his word, God punished them. Folks, today I am concerned about my country. Do we think that the nation of God could sin and be destroyed by God? And we can do the same thing, sin against him, and somehow God will overlook our sin and let our country persist. I, it's not going to happen. When sins pile up and pile up and pile up at some point, God runs out of patience. He unfolds his arm. He takes a, he takes a paddle, a rod in hand, and he comes after people to judge and punish them. I believe wholeheartedly that unless America repents of its idols and sins, the wrath of God is going to fall upon this nation. I love America. I went to war in Vietnam willing to give up my life for the sake of this country. So I love it. I'm concerned for the country. And we must appeal to God like like Joel says, for help, we need the Lord's help. Yeah. I'm, in, I'm still in Roman 4, number 3. The Lord promises to respond to Israel's heartfelt repentance. 2 12. Yet even now, at the 11th hour, now declares the Lord, return all the way back to me wholeheartedly with, and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. 
He will destroy the hostile army and heal Judah's land devastated by the invasion. But there's more. Heaven will also bestow incredibly wonderful spiritual blessings as well, chiefly giving the Holy Spirit to all in deliverance and divine deliverance to all calling on the Lord. Now look at what God promises. 228. And afterwards it will happen that I will abundantly confer my spirit upon a few godly saints. No, upon all humanity. How rare that was in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, God sent the Holy Spirit only upon a select few godly saints that he's commissioned to carry out certain tasks. But God promises to give the Holy Spirit to all of his people. 232, everyone. What a wonderful word this is right there. I can, that can be me. Yeah. That can be you. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be delivered. Number four, down to the bottom. Chapter three is a glimpse into the far or eschatological future. The Lord will gather all Gentile nations to the valley of Jehoshaphat and judge them according to the mistreatment of Israel. But Judah will be forever divinely blessed. This will be Armageddon right here. Now let's go to Romans 5. Perfect. Why did Joel take pen and paper and write this promise? <coughs> Number one, to help Judea uh, realize that the local, the locust code, the locust plague, is divine judgment for her sins. God often speaks to mankind through nature. Like a locust, a locust plague. How about America? What about our storms, hail storms, hurricanes, tornadoes, forest fires out west, heavy snow, heat wave this summer? God, I think, uses nature to get man's attention. But we don't hear very well. <laughs> on, one occasion, on one occasion, Jesus said, although you have ears, you don't hear what I'm saying. Although you've got eyes, you don't see what I'm doing. And I think God is trying to get our attention. Number two, to summon, second purpose, to summon Judeans to repent and return to God, beseeching them, beseeching him to deliver them from ongoing consequences coming from the locust plague. Now, uh, we are in about 830 B.C., 721 B.C. is approaching, when the Assyrians are going to invade. That can be, that can be prevented if Israel repent. They're not going to. Assyria will uh, invade both Judea, and they will invade and conquer the northern kingdom. And then later, 586, that could be averted, but the, the Judeans are not going to repent. And so the Babylonians will invade and destroy the southern kingdom and take the Jews into exile for 70 years. I think, I think that 9-11, September 11, when those towers were attacked and fell, was God's shot across America's bow. Yes. I'm warning you, you must stop living in your gross idolatry and turn to me or worse than these two towers will happen to you. God warned the Judeas by the locust plagues, by his prophets, and the majority of the people did not listen. And that country was destroyed. Not once by the Assyrians, not twice by the Babylonians, but three times later on by the Romans 40 years after Jesus. Number three, third reason, third purpose. To encourage the people that obtaining divine forgiveness and regaining God's favor is possible as it's based on the Lord's gracious, compassionate character. He abounds in loving kindness. Lord, uh, the Lord is going to say in 2.13, but tear your heart and not merely your garments. Uh, when ancient Jews ripped their garments, they showed they were sorrowful, they were repentant, but that could just be an outward show. And so he says, tear your heart, not merely your garments, then return to the Lord your God, for he is, why should we, why should we return to him? He's gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, man in glory of love, and release from punishment. God is determined to punish Israel, but he doesn't want to. Do we parents like punishing our children and grandchildren? Oh, we hate it. But we know it has to be done. Why? To spare the rod is to ruin the child. Does God want to uh, punish Israel? No, he doesn't want to. And he will turn from it if they will only turn away from their sins and return to him. 
Number four, fourth purpose. Now, I think we just covered that, did we not? Number five, to instruct all future generations of Israel. The book's message goes beyond the author's generation, extends to the terminal generation when the Lord returns. Sixth purpose, to affirm that salvation will come to Zion. Again, 232, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be delivered. Because uh, this, should, uh, this should be in Jerusalem, there will be deliverance, as the Lord has promised. That is, among the survivors whom the Lord is calling. Now let's go to Romans 6. What is the theme that runs through this book? It is the day of the Lord mentioned five times. For example, 115. Woe regarding the day. To elaborate, the day of the Lord is there, and it is coming as total destruction inflicted by somebody who could totally destroy the country. And who would that be? Not the Babylonians, not the Assyrians, not the Romans, the Almighty. Uh, we are going to make the Almighty our friend or our enemy. Now, America, you often hear talk, who's America's biggest enemy? Is it China? Is it Russia? Is it North Korea? And North Korea just said they're going to destroy America. Do you know that? Yeah. They have just announced publicly they are going to destroy the United States. Well, I'm not as concerned about them as I am him. He's the Almighty. Amen. So he's either going to be our friend or he's going to be our enemy. Now, if God is our adversary, folks, there's no way we're going to, we're going to be successful. And enjoy life. It can't happen. It won't happen. Romans 7. Now, what's the theological message of this little prophecy? Number one, a recent locust plague has devastated Judah's land and crops. Joel interprets this as divine chastisement upon the people for her sin against the Lord. And he calls this chastisement the day of the Lord. Again, as in uh, 115 here. He urges the people to assemble and repent that they may avoid further subsequent crippling effects of the plague. The day of the Lord is figuratively represented by the locust plague. Number two, Joel sees the day of the Lord in Judah's immediate future when Assyrian and Babylonian armies will invade. So once again, in 2.12, the prophet urges the people to seek God's forgiveness and help to avert these coming enemy invasions. So the Lord is saying, uh, even now, Return all the way back to me, wholeheartedly, and with weeping and mourning. God is giving Israel a chance to repent. They didn't, they didn't seize the opportunity, and their country was invaded and destroyed. I think that God is giving our country an opportunity to repent. He's given even America as a whole may not repent, but you know who can? An individual, a family. A church family. So maybe our whole country is going to be devastated uh, and punished by God, but we as individuals can hear the voice of God and turn from sin. Number three, Joel perceives that the day of the Lord is a double-edged sword. On one hand, it punishes the wicked. Uh, 220. But the northern army, I will remove far from you, that is, I will drive it into a dry, desolate land. It's vanguard into the Dead Sea, and rear guard into the Mediterranean Sea. Consequently, consequently its stench will arise, and its foul odor will go up because it has committed great atrocity. On the other hand, last part of number three, it delivers, the day of the Lord delivers the saints who cry out to God for help. Number four, the seer also looks far into the distant future and sees more and greater hostile armies attack in Jerusalem. This is the eschatological aspect of the day of the Lord. This is Armageddon. Number five, there are four aspects of the day of the Lord. And here are the first three. Historical, the time of Joel, which is about 830 B.C. Number two, second aspect of the day of the Lord, the near future, the immediate future, 722, when Assyria is going to invade, 586, when the Babylonians are going to invade, and then the inaugural part is the church age. So here, here are our dates that we want to remember. Joel's time is about 830 BC. You know, it's about a hundred, a little more than a hundred years before the Assyrian invasion. And then uh, 586 is the time of the Babylonian invasion. 
And then the inaugural part of the day of the Lord is seen in Acts 2, 16, where Peter said, this, this is what was spoken through Joel the prophet. And then uh, 5D, there is the fourth part of the day of the Lord, and that is the distant future, and that is Armageddon. Now, therefore, number six, the day of the Lord includes, now, the day of the Lord is not a 24-hour period of time. It is composed of hundreds and thousands of years. The day of the Lord includes the recent locust plague, the imminent foreign invasion, the day of Pentecost and Acts 2, the rapture, the great tribulation, the parousia, that is the second return of Christ, Armageddon, millennial kingdom, final rebellion, and final judgment. Let's go to the next page. Roman 8. Huge. There are three interpretations of the book. One, apocalyptic. The book predicts only the eschatological day of the Lord when armies will attack Israel and Armageddon. That is, number one, says this refers to something yet future to you and me. Number two, allegorical. Nothing is to be literally understood. Rather, swarming locusts figuratively represent hostile nations attacking Israel. Number three, figuratively. A literal lo locust plague devastates Judah. And this foreshadows an imminent Assyrian and Babylonian invasions of Judah, as well as the remote or eschatological invasion of Israel by many Gentile nations at the end of history. And I'm, uh, uh, I am persuaded by number three that view is correct. Now, just a brief word about number nine, unity. A supposed problem exists with the juxtaposition that is bringing closely together the historical, what happened in the past, with the apocalyptic, what will happen in the future. That is, an actual locust plague and a literal military invasion are mixed with a glimpse into the end of time. But the past events are employed to foreshadow future events. Jesus did a similar thing, predicting... As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish in the past, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth in the immediate future. Roman 10, the New Testament. Joel's influence appears in the New Testament only a couple of times. In Numbers 11, 29, Moses wished that the Holy Spirit would be given to all of God's people. Joel 2, 28, the prophet predicted that the Lord would pour out my spirit on all mankind. Acts 2 says that this prophecy began to be fulfilled when the Spirit came upon folks at Pentecost. Joel 3.13, and here it is, is going to be quoted in, in the book of Revelation. Joel 3.13 says, Put in the sickle, for a harvest is ripe. Come, go down, for the wine press is full. The vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. All of this is a call of judgment and punishment on the nation of Israel. And this is going to be quoted in Revelation uh, 14, or alluded to. Here it is, verse 19. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city, and blood came out of the winepress up to the horses' bronze for 1,600 furlongs. Now let's go to the outline. Uh, you'll notice at the bottom of your page three, the outline consists of three parts. Uh, I see Joel in three divisions. Chapter one, the current crisis. Mm -hmm. Chapter two, the imminent crisis. The current crisis is the lo locust plague. Chapter two, the imminent crisis, the invasions of Assyrian battle. And then chapter three, the fourth crisis, the Gentile nations gather at Jerusalem to destroy the nation. When Jesus comes back and delivers them. Now, taking a closer look at this, the current crisis, this, this little dot, uh, this I right here, uh, means chapter one. The current crisis, recent locust devastation. And uh, as a result of that, Joel is going to summon the nation to prayer. Chapter two, imminent crisis, alarm over invasion by. Assyria and Babylon summons to repent. We can avoid this. Here's God's response if we do repent. And then chapter 3, the bar crisis. Chapter 3 right there, divine judgment of the Gentiles who gather at Jerusalem to destroy the nation, divine blessings of Judea. All right, by way of application, a couple things. 
The Bible says, seek the Lord that you may live, lest he break forth like a fire, O house of Jacob, and, and it will consume with no, with no one to quench it. Now, this is amazing. We should be motivated to seek the Lord. And why? That you may live. Now, that can be taken two ways. And I think both are true. First of all, it can be taken literally. If we don't seek the Lord, he may well take the life of many American citizens. I don't doubt that at all. He took many of the lives of his own people. They perished when the Assyrians and Babylonians invaded them. But that you may live can be interpreted another way. That you may live the abundant life, full joy, all the blessings that God has on you. 232, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We can be saved from coming judgment and destruction if that's what we want. Second, we have all made mistakes and sinned in the past, thus forfeiting wonderful blessings. Repentance brings forgiveness and restores those lost blessings to us. Yeah. Now, here's, here's what God promises. And I want you, this is a well-known verse, but there's one word in this verse that doesn't belong. It doesn't fit. And I wonder what word that is. Years. years. Locusts don't eat years. They eat the crops that have been grown and lost during those years. So when he says, I'll restore you to years, we've all messed up and sinned, folks. That includes your pastor up here. <coughs> and we've all forfeited wonderful blessings and joys and benefits and fruitfulness and effect that God wanted to bestow upon us. It all slipped right through our fingers. And what's his promise here? If we will repent of our sins and come back to him, he will give us back those blessings that earlier we have lost. What a wonderful promise. We've not heard news much better than that. So, Heavenly Father, we do believe this little prophecy, sure, it's a little book, but it carries an atomic bomb, has been written by you. It has an enormous truth that judgment is coming on America. Judgment is coming on each of us as individuals, each of us as a couple, a family, each of us as a church, and it can be avoided if we will turn from whatever is wrong in our life, come back to you, and give your help to amend our lives morally, and you will be glad, eager to bestow upon us blessings and joys and benefits that we lost years ago. May we have the ears to hear that ancient Judea not have. Oh Lord, spare our country. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, uh, I may have surprised you a little bit by taking you to that little spiritual gym, that little obscure prophecy in the Old Testament that most of the church overlooks. Yeah. I may surprise you by the passage that we're going to use to uh, for the Lord's table. I wonder if you've ever heard the celebration of the Lord's Supper from Genesis 14. Oh, that's the Old Testament. It is. <laughs> and so is uh, the Lord's table taught in Genesis 14. Many scholars adamantly believe it is. I don't. I think the Lord's table is foreshadowed, anticipated there. So let's take a quick look at this. Genesis 14, 14. An army from Mesopotamia conquered Sodom, took captives, one of whom was Lot. Abram's nephew. So verse 14, when Abram heard, that is, that his kinsman Lot had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men, not soldiers, shepherds, born in his house, 318. Now, is that a lot of soldiers or shepherds to go to war with? I want you to know, and I don't have time to go into this, but the army from the 
Mesopotamia that destroyed Sodom was powerful. They destroyed everybody coming from Mesopotamia down into Canaan to attack Sodom and Gomorrah. They destroyed everybody got in their way. They are composed of thousands and thousands, maybe tens of thousands. And Abraham's going to take 300 <coughs> shepherds and attack this undefeated army. And Vietnam, uh, there was a battle where there were 250 U.S. Marines, a rifle company, and they were going to attack the North Vietnamese Army that they thought were composed of, of a little over 100 men. What they did, though, was the Vietnamese Army they were about to attack numbered 5,000. So who were 250 Americans attacking 5,000 enemy soldiers? And when the Americans attacked them, oh, the volume of the fire from 5,000 drove the Marines back. They were fortunate to have survived. What is Abraham doing? He's taking 318 and attacking tens of thousands. The Marines didn't win that battle, but God's going to see to it that this glorified shepherd Abraham with 300 men wins his battle. God no doubt gave Abraham uh, the shepherd wisdom in how to attack this huge victorious army. Look at verse 15. And he, Abraham, divided his forces against them by night. Now stop right there. He just violated a cardinal rule in the military. Don't ever split your army if you are outnumbered by the enemy. But he did it. And he and his servants, and he defeated them and pursued them. Uh, he, divide, he divided his forces against them by night. I want you to know I was in one night battle. It wasn't incredibly hard. In fact, I didn't know where it was. The dark was so intense. I heard the shooting all around me. I didn't know where it was. I can't tell you how hard it is to fight at night. This Abraham didn't graduate from West Point. He wasn't a professional soldier. He's a shepherd. I think the hand of God is on this man. Abraham receives every uh, God, Abraham, Abraham, the next verse, uh, he rescues everybody taken captive. Then he Abram brought back all the possession and, all, and brought, back all, brought back his kinsmen, Lot, with his possessions and the women and, and the people. So Lot, Lot goes and defeats a massive Mesopotamian army and recovers all the uh, prisons of war and all the loot and booty that they stole from the wealthy cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. In verse 17, a royal person greets Abraham because he wants... Because... Uh, because a royal person meets Abraham, that's a, that is the <coughs> king of Sodom, because he wants, them, he wants his uh, subjects back that were taken captive. After his return from the defeat of Kedar Laomer and the kings who were with him, there were three kings. Think about that. Four kings, each with the army, combined and went south and, and defeated Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham defeated all four of those armies. The king of Sodom went out to meet him. Verse 18, and Melchizedek, king of Sodom, Salem. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high. So uh, Melchizedek wears two hats. He's the king of, this is ancient, a name for ancient Jerusalem. He's a king and he's priest. He prefigures, he is a type of Jesus Christ. Jesus is king and Jesus is priest as well. In verse 18, a godly man greets Abraham. Or in verse 19, he blesses Abraham. And he, Melchizedek, he, Melchizedek, blessed him, Abraham, and said, Blessed be Abraham by God most high, professor of heaven and earth. Verse uh, 20, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abraham gave him a tenth of all the spooty, the, the booty, and the spoil. Now, I, in my opinion, uh, folks, is this. That when Abraham, when, when the Mesopotamian army invaded Canaan, everybody knew it. So did Melchizedek. He's a godly man. And he knew that Abraham was taking 318 shepherds and going to attack this massive army. And I think it was the prayers of Melchizedek that granted that caused God to grant Abraham success in defeating an enemy that he was greatly outnumbered in. 
Melchizedek was his intercessor. Mm -hmm. We have a heavenly intercessor praying for you and me in the battle that we fought. So bread and wine were brought out. Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, brought out bread and wine. The bread symbolizes his body that was broken, beat, and crucified for our benefit. And the wine represents the blood that he shed to cover our sins. So I'm going to ask the fellows to assist me now <clears throat> as we pass out the elements. And uh, as they're served, please hold them and we will partake together. Okay, fellows, if you would, uh, go ahead and pass those out now. <laughs> the Son of God. He did it on the night he was betrayed. He's only had it, he only partook of this one time. You and I have had communion many, many times. Jesus one time. The next time the Son of God partakes of what we're doing here, it will be with you and me. So this is very important to him. And my, how he must be longing for the day that he's going to partake of this ordinance Again, with all of his blood brought saved. This bread represents the wonderful benefits of Jesus' death and salvation. We have to eat food day after day to keep our strength up. We need to be interacting with Jesus day after day to keep our moral strength up. We need to be receiving his grace every day to maintain a healthy relationship with him. So he told his disciples, when you eat this bread, you remember my death. And he urged them to partake of it. So let's partake of the bread together. And the next element is the cup. And as you receive it, again, please hold it and we will partake of it together. Around the world that have AIDS, AIDS.
IDS. Mm -hmm. And that person who has it can do nothing to get rid of it. He can't go to any physician, any scientist. He can't take any pill. There's no machine that will purge AIDS out of him because the cure hasn't been found yet. And so he's going to die. You and I have moral AIDS. It's called S-I-N. There is nothing we can do to get rid of, of ourselves. Reading the Bible doesn't do it. Being baptized doesn't do it. Giving money to, to the church doesn't do it. Good works don't, doesn't do it. The Bible says sin is so bad, there's only one solution to it. Without the shedding of Christ's blood, there is no forgiveness. This, cup, this juice reminds us the Savior's blood washes. So our moral age can be removed. And there's only one thing in the entire universe that will remove it. The death of Jesus at the cross. So I'm gratitude. In remembrance of that, let's do as he invited us and partake of the, of the juice. Father, we thank you that even when we were your enemies, dead in sin, even then, you loved us, mm -hmm. and you gave up your only son. And Jesus, thank you for leaving the throne in heaven for a cross on earth and being willing to be blamed and punished for our sins. God's wrath fell on you, so it need not fall on us. Mm -hmm. And I pray now, Lord, if there's one person here this morning that doesn't know you, the gospel will be clear, and that person will yearn for you, Jesus. Now, Lord... For the rest of us who are your people, may Psalm 101 resonate. I will walk in my house with a healthy heart, a good relationship with you. Strengthen us this week, Lord, so that we remain morally healthy and pleasing to you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand and turn to the Lord. 433, I surrender all. 433.
Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us all here together again to praise you and worship you. Thank you for your unspeakable gift, Lord Jesus. And please guide us through this week and send the Holy Spirit to be with us and, and, and resist temptation, resist sin, so we can make you proud, Lord Jesus. Bless the food we're about to consume and bless this church, Lord Jesus. Thank you very much in your mighty, mighty name. Amen. Amen. Amen.